chapter 9 this morning. Matthew chapter 9 is where we'll be at in just a few moments. As we come together, we've been looking at what it means to have this uh, faith that changes the world. This faith that was the kind of faith you had as a child. And so we've been looking at that. I've been calling it this dangerous faith that you have in your life each and every day. It's the place where our souls come together. It's the place where our souls come to life and we sense that we're almost there on this great way to life. And it's when that danger of the world gives away to this wonder of Christ. But as we get started this morning, I want to ask you a question. Kind of like what I was talking to the children about just a minute ago. Are you excited? Are you excited to, to be here this morning? Are you excited that you can come to church today? Are you excited to see God working in your life or in the life of others? And are you excited to know God in your life today? And I know I said one question and that was three, but still, you get the point. Are you excited today? Are you excited for God and about God today? Are you excited about the things that He has done in your life? But then the question also becomes, are you excited about the things He's going to do in your life? Sometimes we get so caught up in what is going on that we're not even looking at what God has already planned for our life. And so this morning, I'm asking you the question is, are you excited? And if you're not excited, what is getting in the way of you being excited today? I, I call this the dream stealing, uh, uh, overcoming faith stealing or dream stealing is what I've called this today because I want us to see what is keeping us from having that excitement for God in our life, what is stealing our faith, what is stealing our dreams in our life, and what can we do to overcome it? What can we do to say, God, I want to follow you and I want to be excited about it. I want to be excited about it. We are Christians, folks. We shouldn't be walking around gloom eeyore -ish. Let's put it that way. We shouldn't be like that. We should not be ones that are not excited because we already have Jesus Christ in our life and we've already seen what he has done for us. So this morning, what can we do to make sure we keep that excitement in our lives? So I want us to look at Matthew chapter 9. This is what I talked to the children about. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in, that, in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so here's the story. Matthew is a tax collector. In those days, tax collectors were low. And when I say low, they put sinners here and tax collectors down here, okay? That's the way the Jewish people looked at tax collectors. So Matthew wasn't an upstanding citizen, so to say, in our day. He wasn't one that was there, but Jesus called him to follow him. Matthew left him and followed him. Well, Matthew was so excited about it, Luke said that basically he threw him in this little party. He wanted to have a party. Uh, we can elaborate on this more, but there was excitement there. Matthew had excitement. He invited people, and Jesus was there, and Jesus was going to meet these people. But then the Pharisees come in. The Pharisees. Now, if anybody could bring a frown to your face, it was a Pharisee. They were quick at it, too. They could come in, and as soon as they came in, everybody just kind of, oh, the Pharisees are here. They could take away the smile quickly. They could take away your faith. They could take away your dreams in a heartbeat. That's what they did. And so they came in, and they said, why would Jesus eat with these people and started just tearing down the wall, tearing down all the fun and all the happiness that was there? They were dream-stealing is what they were doing. Faith thievery, if you want to call it that. They were taking the childlike faith of Matthew and they were chasing it away. 
They were taking that faith that Matthew had and they were running it away and saying, it shouldn't be here. Go away. Dream stealing, faith thievery, ever how you want to look at it. It's when others look at your faith and say it shouldn't be that way or you can't do that or God can't do that. When you lose your faith in that way and your faith is stolen, you're convinced that God can't do something. You're convinced that God doesn't want to work in your life. And that's what was happening here to Matthew and to the people of the party. The, the tax collectors, the sinners were there. Jesus was there. Jesus, I guarantee you this. Jesus was having a good time at that party. You may tell you why I know. Because he was able to talk of all these sinners, and he was able to talk to all these tax collectors, and he was telling them about the kingdom of God. I guarantee it. And if Jesus Christ was doing that, I guarantee you Jesus Christ had a smile on his face while he was doing it. He was happy. And then the Pharisees came in. And then the Pharisees began to say, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you shouldn't be talking to sinners, and you shouldn't be talking to tax collectors. You can't, you can't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, the music stops. The people start looking around, and they're like, let's just go home. No more fun. No more fun anymore. And that's what the Pharisees do. But here's the problem. It happens in our lives without Pharisees a lot of times. A lot of times, we're doing good. We're, we're there. We're excited. We're like the children talking about their birthdays and the presents and the thing. Get excited about Saturday morning cartoons. We get excited about these things. We get excited about God. We see somebody come to know Jesus Christ, and we get excited. We're going to have a baptism pretty soon from the children that uh, uh, got saved at camp over the summer. We're going to baptize them. I would expect to see excitement in the church when these things happen. We, we got a, a, new, a new person that we're going to ordain as a deacon pretty soon. Uh, excitement. And then all of a sudden, Satan comes in and something happens or, or something didn't go the way we wanted it to go or, or, or something goes wrong in our lives and we begin to lose that faith. And we go from a smile to a frown. And our dreams of what God is doing, our faith in what God is going to do, get stolen right out from under us before we ever know what happens. So how does that happen? And what can we do about it? And how can our faith help us overcome? That's what we want to look at this morning as we go through this. So first of all, I want us to look at how your faith, your dreams are stolen. And the first way is this. We are told to live in a religious shell. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean when you say, we are told to live in a religious shell? Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. There's a story of a, a, a Bible college student. His first year, his freshman year, he was excited to be in school. He, his words were, I was wildly enthusiastic about my faith, were his words. He said, I quickly became active in all the college events. He said this, and I want to make sure I said this, he was in a Bible college. He was excited about everything that was happening. And so he and his, some of his friends signed up for a campus talent show. And for two months, they were working on this jazz music that they were going to play at the campus talent show. And they kept working on it, working on it. And he, he said, everyone who heard his practice was impressed. He said the applause in the rehearsal hall was deafening when we finished our tryouts, and we were sure that we were going to make the performance and win. He said, but then suddenly we were called outside by a harsh-looking man. The man said, I'm sorry, but you will not be able to perform tonight. Your song is too worldly. It sounds too much like a song that would be sung in a nightclub. I looked at him. The, the, the person that writes this said, I looked at him and said, What? But we're not. We're at a Christian school. And it's nothing but music. There's not even words to the song. It's just music. He said, the decision is final. And he walked away. He said, our group was crushed. I never recovered. My enthusiasm was, was gone. And I withdrew from all college activities. We're told that we can't do certain things because it might look too much like the world. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is we're told to live in a religious shell. Here's what we're told. 
we're told that we have to completely remove ourselves from everything in the world. We're supposed to move up in the mountains, live in a monastery or wherever you want, away from everybody, and worship Christ. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that we are to be in the world, but not part of the world. We are to be in the world, but separated from the world. The Bible tells us that we're to be like Jesus, and we're to be around the tax collectors. We're to be around the sinners. We're to be around them, but we're not to be like them. That's the difference. We are told to be in the world, but to, it comes the Pharisees come along, and the Pharisees say, you can't be a sinner, you can't hang with a sinner, you can't do that because we don't really know if God cares about them. That's what the Pharisees would say. But childlike faith means this. You're trusting God to help you make it in the world so that you can be a witness to the world. And that's where your faith comes in. You see, we can't limit God's reach and power by hiding ourselves from the world. We are to live in the world. We are to stand out from the world, but we're to stand up in the world today. So if you're told that you're to live in a religious shell, just know that that's not where Jesus Christ wants you. He wants you in the world. He wants you with those who don't know him. The second thing that happens that steals our faith is we make God too small. We make God too small, and we're good at this. We are so good in our world today of making God too small. We say something like, oh, God is too busy, or oh, God can't handle that, or it's too big of a problem for God. We need to look and say, God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Sometimes the people who want to destroy our faith, number one, Satan, wants us to believe that God can't do certain things. Satan wants to whisper in your ears today and he wants to tell you that don't take that to God because God can't help you with that. Don't take that problem to God because God's not interested in that. You and I can't limit our faith by what we think God can and cannot do. Because if we try to figure out what God can and cannot do, we'll get a headache because God can do anything. Try to figure out when God began. Your head will swirl for months. God is a God of the impossible. But we come along and we say, oh God, you just can't handle that. Oh God, it's my problem. Don't worry about it, God, because I know I I, I don't want to limit that. See, here's what we say. We say, "There's there's a thousand pound boulder right here, and we say nobody on earth can pick up this boulder by themselves. Therefore, God can't pick up this boulder because God is like us. That's what's said a lot of times. God can't do something because man can't do it. I'm here to tell you there's not a thing in this world that God can't do. Don't make God too small and let it steal your dreams and your hopes and your faith. When we or others in our lives limit God, we lose faith in the abilities that God wants to use for us. So we're told to live away from the world. If that doesn't work, then we're told that God is too, we make God too small in our lives. Well, then the next thing we do, if that doesn't work, we decide to give God guidelines. So we try to tell God what he can and can't do. There's a Bible story in John chapter 9. I'm not going to read you the story for time today, but Jesus healed a blind man on the Sabbath. I believe I preached about this a few months ago. He, he healed a blind man on the Sabbath. And the blind man was, was walking. Uh, Jesus told him to go and walk and, and, and to, to clean his eyes. And then he came back and he could see. And the, the Pharisees found out what happened. And the Pharisees were like, you know, you healed him on the Sabbath. That's illegal. And Jesus, you know, I can just hear Jesus going, why is it illegal to help someone on a Sabbath day? The Pharisees had given God guidelines. They had said, you can do this on this day, you can do this here, you can do this, but you can't do this and you can't do that. God never said most of the things that the Pharisees said. But you and I, we're pretty good about giving God God guidelines in our lives too, aren't we? 
We like to do that. We place guidelines on our life, and it diminishes our faith. But we like to look at God and say, okay, God, this is my life that I'll give to you. And then over here, this is the life that I give to me. And we're giving God guidelines. You can, you can have that part, but you can't have this part. Or God, you can do this in my life, but you can't do that in my life. We like to give God these guidelines. But until we allow ourselves to open our entire lives up to God and say, God, you're free to do anything, then our faith is diminished, our dreams are stolen, and we can't live the way God wants us to live. We can't set boundaries for God. We can't set boundaries for our Creator. We can't set boundaries for the one who sent His Son to die for us on the cross. We can't look at that. We need to look at God and say, God, everything is possible through you, and I give you my entire life so that you can do what you want to do in my life. But instead, we give Him boundaries, and we keep Him in a box and say, you can only do these things, God. And we need to understand that there are more things in our lives that God wants to do. And we just need to be open to those. So, we keep him in, we keep him in a shell. We, 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 don't, we don't go out. We, we make him small. We give him guidelines. But then we do this. If none of that works, the next thing we try is this. We treasure earthly things over spiritual things. We treasure the things of the world over the things of God. And you want to have your faith stolen from you in a moment? Just begin to put your faith in the things of man and not in God. We rely on worldly treasures instead of spiritual gifts from God. And they do nothing but let us down whenever we rely on the world. How many times do we blame the world instead of God? Not many. Most of the time it's the other way around, isn't it? Most of the time, something happens. We don't say, well, it's because of the world. Most of the time, we look up to God and we say, God, it's your fault that this happened. When we do that, we put worldly things or earthly treasures over the things of God. We do that. And our faith is stolen. How is our faith stolen? Our faith is stolen by the things of the world. Our faith is stolen by putting our trust in the things of this world. Our faith is stolen when we say, God, it's your fault. I'm going to embrace the world. It's easier to embrace the world sometimes, but it steals our faith. It steals our dreams that God wants for us. And then finally, we are told to be somber, not full of life. This is what the Pharisees wanted. When Jesus was having dinner with Matthew, this sinner, this tax collector. The Pharisees came in in their full robes, probably their fancy little hats that they wore when they walked around. They stood up straight. They wanted everybody to know they were there. And they came in and they were like, you cannot have fun and serve God. What do you think? Can we have fun and serve God? We are told and I've heard this before, that if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a Christian, then you can't have any fun. You can't walk around with a smile on your face. Well, I'm sorry. The creator of the world gave his only son so that I can have eternal life, and that puts a smile on my face. We are told, though, we have to be somber. We, we can't be full of life. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life more abundantly. He wants us to have an exciting life. Not an exciting life that follows the way of the world, but the exciting life that is blessed by God every moment of every day. But what we do is we get around and we go, we are Christians. And because of that, we must not be full of life. We can't live that way. If we're going to be Christians and we want to live the life God wants us to live, we must be full of life and unashamed of the gospel. And if you're going to be unashamed of the gospel, then you're going to be full of life. But when the moment you decide you're not going to be full of life anymore, your faith is stolen right out from under you by Satan. And that's what he wants from you. Because whenever he steals our faith, when he steals it, it does a few things to us. When he steals it, it steals our joy. 
removes all joy that comes from serving the Lord. I don't know about you, but I enjoy serving God. I enjoy serving God. I know it's hard sometimes. I know it's hard. I and mean, there are days that, that things are going on in my life outside of, of what God is wanting me to do, and I'm fighting with Him over what I should do with the world versus Him, and some days it doesn't seem like it's joyful. But I can guarantee you this, when I give in to God and I do what God wants, you, wants me to do, my life gets a whole lot more joyful. But if Satan comes in, he wants to remove our joy, and then he wants to remove our enthusiasm. He wants to remove that excitement. When we are told we can't do something because God is too small, it takes all the excitement away. When we're told that we can't be around those that God wants us to serve, it takes our enthusiasm away. We need to be excited. We need to be like the little children when they see that birthday cake. We need to be like children when they open up that present on Christmas morning or on their birthday and they see this thing they've been asking for for a long time. And they get excited about it. That's what we need. We need to have enthusiasm in our lives. But Satan wants to come in and steal it. The next thing it does is it removes us from God's work. When your faith is stolen, the next thing that happens is your work for God starts moving away farther and farther and farther, and you begin to stop working. And then finally, it destroys our faith in God. Ultimately, what happens if Satan wants to win is he destroys our faith in God by stealing all the things that God wants to do in our life. So how do we overcome this? How do we overcome the Pharisee Satan in our life that says, I want to take all your excitement and I want to pull it away. How do we overcome that? Real quickly. We live in Christ wherever you are. What does that mean to live in Christ wherever you are? That means that no matter where you're at, you're serving God. Jesus, at a party with tax collectors and sinners, what was he doing? He was serving God. What was he doing to serve God? He was telling them about the kingdom of heaven. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, live in Christ. Don't lose sight of what Christ wants to do in your life. If Christ was among sinners, then we must be amongst them also. Living your life for Christ is an essential way to keep your faith in Him. Live your life for Him. Let Him live through you today. As you're living your life for Him, believe Philippians 4.13. I'm not going to read it for you, but know that it says this. All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Through Christ, through Christ, we can accomplish anything. But here's the problem. We try to accomplish the things of the world and then blame God when it doesn't happen. The all things are possible with God verse is if we're doing the things God wants us to do, all things are possible. If you and I are doing the things God wants us to do, there is nothing that can hold us back. There is nothing that can keep us from doing God's work. Only our lack of faith can make God smaller than he is. Only our lack of faith. And then we must trust God to take us outside our normal boundaries. We must trust God to take us outside or to take us outside our normal boundaries. What does this mean? This means go someplace you wouldn't normally go. What does that mean? That means that do something you wouldn't normally do. What does that mean? That means get outside your comfort zone for God. That means tell that person that God's been working on you to tell about Jesus Christ, go and talk to them. That means to serve in the church where God's been wanting you to serve, but you've been too, too uh, 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 unfaithful, I guess is the word to say, or, or too afraid to take it. Go outside your boundaries. Don't be afraid to listen to God. Don't be afraid to be like Jesus, because here's what Jesus did. Jesus came into the world, and he took the religion of the day, and he turned it up upside down because it's not about religion it's about Jesus Christ it's not about Southern Baptist it's about Jesus Christ 
It's not about this denomination or that denomination or the way we sing this song or the way we sing that song. It is about glorifying Jesus Christ. And to do that, sometimes we've got to step outside our comfort zone. And we must be willing to do that. And it takes faith to do that. We can't be afraid to follow where we feel God is leading us, even if it's outside the normal for today, because let me tell you, there's a lot of scary stuff in the normal for today. There's a lot of scary stuff outside of that. And then finally, we need to surrender our lives to his dream and his plans. Be in Matthew. Here's what I mean by that, by being Matthew. Matthew was comfortable in his life. He was sitting behind his little tax table. He had his little booklet out there. He was collecting people's money. He was making money. He was doing good in life. Jesus Christ came along. He saw Matthew at his table, and he said, Matthew, come and follow me. Matthew didn't say, I'm going to stay behind my table and make money. Matthew didn't say, I I'm fine where I'm at. Matthew got up. He followed Jesus Christ, but then it didn't stop there. He followed Jesus Christ and gave up all that he had because we never see Matthew go back to the tax table. We see Matthew follow Jesus Christ for about three years, and then we see Matthew continue to serve Jesus Christ until he is killed for his faith in Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to his dreams and his plans. The Pharisees looked at Matthew and said, religion should not make you full of life. It should be serious business. It's about rules. It's about regulations. You need to learn your place. And Matthew said, my place is next to Jesus Christ. And that's what you and I need to say today. Our place is next to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the faith giver. Jesus Christ is the dream giver. He is the one that does that. He is the one that gives us all that we have. We need to be like Matthew and say, I'm going to follow you with a dangerous faith that leads me wherever it is. I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore the Pharisees. I'm going to ignore the guidelines. I'm going to ignore the rules. And I'm going to follow Jesus. The Bible tells us that nothing can remove us from God's hand. And if we believe that, we'll live like that. And that's what we need to do today. Bottom of your note sheet says this. We are the only thing that limits God in our lives. Think about that. The only thing that limits God's work in your life is you. Your faith that you have today. Be like Matthew. Be like that child. Have the faith that Jesus Christ is going to do great things in your life today. Let me ask you a question. Are you excited? Or has your faith already been stolen? Are you excited about God's work and what he's going to do for you in the future or your dreams already been stolen? There's only one way to get that faith and those dreams back, and that's through Jesus Christ. We can't do it on our own. We've got to be like Matthew. And we've got to say this morning, I'm going to get up from my comfortable life and I'm going to follow you wherever you take me. And I'm going to do it with excitement. Why do I know that Matthew did it with excitement? Because the Bible says he threw a party and invited all of his friends to see Jesus. What if we did that? What if I stood up here one Sunday morning and said, Hey, next Sunday we're not going to have church. Instead, we're going to throw a party and invite a whole community to come join us in a party to see Jesus Christ. I just got some weird looks. No. You know what I'm talking about, though. You'd be like, why do we need to do this? Why, why are we having a party? We're having a party so that people can know Jesus Christ. That's why Matthew had a party. He didn't have a party for any other reason so that his friends could come and meet Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for us today. He wants us to say, nothing is going to steal my dreams. Nothing is going to steal my faith in Jesus Christ. I am going to follow him and put my faith in him, and nothing can stop God once I trust in him. That's what he wants out of us today. That's what he wants out of you today. Are you willing, are you willing to follow him in that way today? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the faith that Matthew showed. And Father, we ask this morning that as we try to have that kind of faith, Lord, that you will help us. 
Father, put that excitement in our life. Father, help us understand our place in the world, Lord, that we need to stand out from the world, but we need to be in the world today. Father, help us to trust in you to give us the strength and the power and the faith that we need to make it. Lord, let us tell others about you. And let us live a life, Lord, that is completely surrendered to you today. Lord, as we come together this morning to sing, Lord, as we think about this, this time of decision-making that we're about to have, speak to our hearts today. Father, we know that when Jesus Christ spoke to Matthew and he said, come and follow me, Lord, that Matthew heard it in his heart and he answered with his heart. So, Father, I pray today that we will hear you in our hearts and that we will answer with our hearts this morning, Lord. Change our lives. Change our faith. Lord, I pray that you will not allow anything to steal our faith away from us. And Lord, if our faith has already been stolen away, Father, help us to get it back by trusting in you this morning. Lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray.